in a Wild West ghost town. A teenager stumbles upon a dilapidated gold mine and its owner. She had a no trespassing sign at the gate. Does she say, I'm calling the cops, or does she pull a, Annie, get your gun? It's the start of an uncommon relationship. I'm thinking you're a smooth operator. No, it was just the history I was interested in. <laughs> Next thing her family knows, the guy's getting their strange inheritance. I said, I certainly hope you're on the up and up. But is this old mind spent? Bruce, I got a lot of respect for you now. Or could it still make him rich? There's still gold here. This is by far the hottest result that I've ever worked with. Holy Christmas. I'm Jamie Colby, and today I'm driving along the Columbia Mountain Range in Esmeralda County, Nevada. I'm going to meet a man whose strange inheritance is a patch of semi-abandoned ghost town, population 268. But it used to be Nevada's largest and richest city. Why? Well, they tell me it has something to do with the town's name. Welcome to Goldfield. My name is John Oreck, and I inherited a gold mine. John, hi, I'm Jamie. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. So I made it to the middle of nowhere. Wow. Can you imagine so inheriting a gold mine? Fine. The air John Oreck no, shows me around. Mine. Can I walk right up to it? You can. How far down is that? 1,650 feet. Whoa. It's called the Florence Mine, named after the daughter of an old prospector who discovered it in 1903. This is the original shaft of the Florence. Bureau of Mines estimates about 17 miles of workings underground. So how much gold came out of this mine? About $9 million, and that was at $20.67 an ounce. John tells me that to understand the backstory of his strange inheritance, I should visit the little ghost town down the hill. So I seek out veteran gold miner and local historian, Bob Bottom. Hi, I'm Jamie. Hi, Jamie. Nice to meet you. John sent me down. He said you could tell me a little bit about Goldfield. Sure. Well, Goldfield was discovered in 1902. How big a boom was there during the gold yeah. years? There was a few years from its biggest city in Nevada. That's right, the biggest city in the state. The population was over 20,000 at a time when only 400 people lived in the sleepy outpost of Las Vegas. Restaurants, theaters, and saloons with gambling halls are everywhere, while miners earn $5 a day, twice the average wage. What was this building? This here was a bank of one time, and it was a mining office also. Nixon and Wingfield were well-known money men. Nixon and Wingfield owned Goldfield Consolidated Mines. By 1907, it's the 17th largest corporation in the U.S. But by 1911, gold production declines rapidly, and the boom goes bust. I recall a quote from Mark Twain. Is it true that a gold mine is a hole in the ground next to a liar? Definitely. More money made on promotions than there has been producing gold. By the mid-1920s, fewer than 1,500 people remain in Goldfield, including a 24-year-old die-hard gold miner named Martin Duffy. This strange inheritance story really starts with him. Duffy believes there's still plenty of gold in Goldfield, and he proves it in 1939 when he strikes it rich in a section of the Florence mine that he was leasing. His haul, $160,000 the equivalent of 2.6 million today. I just remember Martin as being a hard worker and he was always looking for gold. In 1944, Martin marries 29-year-old school teacher Ruth Rowe. They settle into this house, which they move, so it sits right on top of the mine. Ruth's niece, Barbara Sheffield, recalls visiting Goldfield as a kid. I remember waking up at night and a cow was walking down the street and it was just a fun time. Martin becomes a Nevada state senator, but his passion is always the Florence. By 1962, he and Ruth buy a 50% share in it. And Martin keeps on mining, 
certain he'll strike it rich again. Goldfield was a magic name at the turn of the century. Now, only one mine is operating. The Duffies run an old school operation, as you can see from this National Geographic documentary from 1971. Ruth lowers the winch, while Martin rides this tiny platform deep into the mine. With all the glamour and the fabulous ore that was found here, it's only natural that I'd want to find some myself. Before the end, I hope to get to that pot of gold. Not long after this film is made, Duffy locates what he believes is that pot of gold in a part of the mine 450 feet down. But then, on August 27, 1971, he falls in the shaft. Ruth calls for help and rushes Martin to a hospital, but he dies the next morning of internal injuries. He is 71 years old. Ruth is his sole heir. Over the next decade, Ruth, with no children of her own, mostly keeps to herself in this ghost town. Then in the summer of 1982, a 16-year-old from California stumbles into her life. John Oreck has come to Goldfield with a friend to check out the historical sites, he says. I wanted to see the head frame because it was the tallest wood head frame in the state of Nevada. And that's when I came up here and met Ruth Duffy. Ruth, now 67, sees the teenager wandering around her property. Ruth had a no trespassing sign at the gate. Does she say, I'm calling the cops, or does she pull a, Annie, get your gun? We talked about a half hour outside. She asked me in. We played pool for about two hours. And she could tell that I was versed in Goldfield history. The two are 51 years apart, but nonetheless, a friendship develops. By 1994, 28-year-old John is still coming out for regular visits with Ruth. He's become a finishing carpenter and begins restoring several Goldfield buildings he's bought dirt cheap, hoping tourism will catch on. To bring back some of that flavor of the past and to have tourists feel a little of that magic Ruth is impressed. Pushing 80, she decides she wants John to inherit her part of the Florence. She was liking what I was doing in town as far as restoration of the buildings. But as you're about to see, Ruth's relatives, including her niece, Barbara Sheffield, regard John as someone who burrowed his way into a lonely old woman's life. She had been a widow for 25 years when she did this. She was just used to doing things by herself without seeking counsel at all. You're a smooth operator. No. It was just the history I was interested in. She was a lady you couldn't really manipulate because she would figure you out and she would call your hand on it. A dispute over this strange inheritance turns nasty and ends up in court. What did she accuse you of? Unjust enrichment, elder abuse manipulation that's next but first our strange inheritance quiz question if you stretch a single ounce of gold into the thinnest wire possible how long would it be 50 feet 50 yards or 50 miles the answer when we return so how far could one ounce of gold span if it were made into a wire the answer is C. An ounce of gold can be turned into a very thin wire, one five thousandth of an inch thick, that stretches for 50 miles. For decades, Martin and Ruth Duffy live on top of this hundred-year-old gold mine in Nevada. She runs the controls from this hoist room, sending her husband down into the mine. It's a little creaky and old, John. This was her office, basically. That was her office from 9 o'clock in the morning. Then she would go to her house. And then around 3.30 in the afternoon, she would come and wait for the bell signal. May I? Yes. I, these are the controls? This is the speed. OK. These adjustments are for the brake. Let me just see if I could. So basically, oh my gosh. So Ruth would sit here. Her husband is down there somewhere. Martin, she can't even talk to him. And it's like. Oh my gosh, this reminds me of having to
And I said, I certainly hope that you are honest because I believe that all of us are going to are accountable for our actions. And so I hope you're on the up and up. Barbara believes that Aunt Ruth is suffering from the early stages of dementia and should return with her to Colorado for medical care. Anybody that's familiar with dementia knows once you have something like that occur to you, you kind of nose dive down and then you'll come back up, but you'll never come back up to where you were before. John firmly believes that Ruth did not have dementia when she left Goldfield. Through the phone calls that I got from her for a while, she seems sharp as a tack. But Barbara believes John shouldn't inherit any part of the mine. In fact, she says she and her aunt would prefer to see it become a state park. John refuses to give up his title to it. So Barbara becomes her aunt's legal guardian and sues John. And she signs a deed on Ruth's behalf, transferring Ruth's share in the mine to herself to ensure, she says, that her aunt's intent is honored. What did she accuse you of? unjust enrichment, elder abuse, manipulation. But John gives as good as he gets. Mr. Oreck's attorney attacked my integrity. I'd never had that done before. The lawsuit goes to trial in December 2001. Turns out John has an ace in the hole. Did Ruth ever explain to anybody else that she wanted you to be the one to oversee what she and Martin had built? Bernie Chapman. Barney Chapman is a real estate broker whose friendship with Ruth and Martin Duffy goes back to the 1960s. From Colorado, Ruth wrote to Barney about the couple's longtime desire to preserve the mine as an historic site. What did you tell the judge when you were on the stand? Your Honor, I have a letter, and it states very simply, Dear Barney, I think I found someone that will live up to Martin's wishes. And she said she trusted him. Who was she talking about? John. On December 5th, 2001, a judge rules that Barbara's petition in its entirety is denied. My Aunt Ruth had dementia, and I, I truly believe she did. But to prove that, it's just very difficult. And, and obviously, we weren't able to. I was very disappointed. Oh, I'm sorry. Ruth Duffy dies just six months later. John gets to keep his strange inheritance. I think the judge could see there wasn't a manipulation or an unjust enrichment because the mine was just a historical relic. I wonder, how can John know it won't produce again? Technology has improved. You may be able to bring in another company lease the mine and have them come and pull up some of this gold for you. That's the lure of the gold, you know. People think, wow, it's get rich quick. You have any samples around that maybe you'd let our show take and have tested? Yes, there's some samples that Martin had. They were there in the basement. He was mining a certain area that he thought looked very promising. And Ruth told me about it. John says this is one of those samples. It's from 1971, and one of the last Martin Duffy pulled from the mine before his death. Remember, he thought he was on the verge of his next big strike. Maybe he was. This is by far the hottest result that I've ever worked with. That's next. Here's another quiz question for you. The 1849 California Gold Rush spawned the phrase 49ers. How many dollars worth of gold did the 49ers find in that first year? Was it $1 million, $10 million, or $27 million? The answer in a moment. So, how much gold did the 49ers find in 1849? It's B. In that first year of the gold rush, miners found $10 million worth of gold, the equivalent of $300 million in today's money. Remember Martin Duffy, the prospector you met at the beginning of this strange inheritance story? With all the fabulous ore that was found here, I hope to get to that pot of gold myself. Alas, Martin met his end before getting to that pot of gold. 
but I can't stop wondering if he was about to hit the mother load. So we go to Salt Lake City to ask Jim Steben, a metal processing engineer, to test a rock that John told us Martin pulled from the Florence mine shortly before he fell to his death. The sample I received from John Ulrich was only a pound in size. We crushed the material and then ground the material down to a fine powder. Jim prepares it for what's known as a fire assay, or a test, to determine how much gold is in the rock. Doesn't look like much gold, but Jim says, don't be fooled. This could be in a very hot zone in a vein. There's no telling if that vein is two inches or 50 feet deep, but this is by far the hottest result that I've ever worked with. Had you ever had a lab in this area look at any of the samples you gave me? No. And you would be excited to know if it were what? 10 ounces a ton is a great number. How's 300? 300? 300 ounces a ton. Holy Christmas. 300 ounces is incredible. You know, that's interesting because that's what the lab technician, highly trained, told us. Wow. Martin was close to gold at the end of the rainbow. Part of your strange inheritance. And that's strange. I'm perplexed. I was thinking he'd be jumping up and down. So why isn't he? A surprising answer after the break. What's your strange inheritance story? We'd love to hear it. Send me an email or go to our website, strangeinheritance.com. And now the conclusion of Strange Inheritance. Florence Mine Hoist House, 1906. One of the best preserved in the state of Nevada. I thought I'd make a little video of it so people could see it. Since he inherited this gold mine in 2002, history buff John Oreck has been trying to preserve the site, and he creates dozens of videos of the artifacts he's found in it. There's some cabinets they used to put their tools in. This segment is about blueprints. Yeah, yeah, all that history stuff is fine, but I guess I'm more like that old prospector Martin Duffy. I want to know if there's still gold down there. So I took a rock John says is from the mine, had it tested, and was able to inform John there was a high percentage of gold in it. I'm shocked. Shocked, but apparently not overjoyed. What am I missing? Well, for starters, John tells me, the mine would need extensive renovation before anyone could work it. It's been flooded, the gypsum walls have contracted, and the tunnels are liable to cave in. In other words, things were a lot dicier since the last guy was killed down there. Oh, and in the years since he got his strange inheritance, John's become a husband and father. If you were to go ahead and proceed with mining, when do I come back and find you still in this home of Ruth's that you've preserved and maybe getting a few extra bucks for your two adorable children from mining? I'd have to talk it over with my wife and see, because this is really uh, a lot to, to digest. If John wanted to do something with the mine, it is my understanding that he would have to have my permission to do so. Then there's Ruth's niece, Barbara, who claims a share of this strange inheritance. She's even less bullish on opening up the Florence again. I can't honestly think of a situation where I would want the mine to be exploited. With John and Barbara intent on preserving the mine as an historical site, they both fear a force that would be out of their control. It'll be a gold rush. To your door? Yes. I guess I see why that worries John. But I gotta tell you, I'm thinking, wouldn't it be cool if that lab result does prove old Martin was right? And if this ghost town did get one more boom? Then again, maybe I just caught my own case of gold fever out here. Seems the story's not over. The state of Nevada says it's rerouting a highway to make room for a new gold mine way over yonder. And John says he's fielded multiple calls from companies looking to explore the possible riches right here in his strange inheritance. Sure is nice to be sitting on a gold mine. I'm Jamie Colby for Strange Inheritance. Thanks so much for watching. And remember, you can't take it with you.